We want to be disciples of Jesus Christ. That's what we've been called to. And being a disciple means to be raised as a city changer. And uh, being a city changer, we believe these three outcomes to be areas in which we can measure our progress. Uh, knowing God, loving people, impacting your world. When we looked at knowing God, it was about God working in us. Now we're looking at loving people, and it literally means that God wants to do stuff through us. And we recognized in our previous session that when we talk about God working through us, there is a motivation that is necessary that is called love or compassion, that which, which we recognize as we were at the receiving end of. And because we are loved, we now love. And love is a value statement. But one of the things every Christ follower needs to deeply discover and understand is the fact that we are all called. There's a calling upon your life, upon my life. In Doxodeo, we actually don't like to talk to people being volunteers. We recognize that a volunteer is someone that helps somebody else fulfill their calling. But what if you respond to an area of service with an understanding that it is a calling? You see, you can walk away from being a volunteer, but how do you walk away from being called? Now, when we recognize this, we, we want to see every individual who is a Christ follower as a co-laborer, as a partner, a person that recognizes that God has put his hand on your life and you are now responsible responding to that call upon your life. It's interesting when Paul references the people that actually journeyed with him, uh, he would say things like uh, in uh, Philemon 1, 24, and so do Mark and Demas and Luke, my fellow workers. In Colossians 4, 11, he says, these are are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom, and they have proved a comfort to me. And then in Philippians 4 verse 3, he speaks about uh, these people that were true companions, and he says, they came to my side for the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers. So Paul was always very aware that these were people that, had something of a sense of, of a commissioning, of a calling, of a purpose in their own lives, and they were committed to this process. Now, the concept of calling is interesting when we read about it in the Bible. Uh, there are different dimensions to this thought of calling. The first time uh, we read about calling, it's really about the fact that we are called to walk worthy the calling, which means the reference to our understanding of who we are in Christ. Our first calling is a calling to live according to this revelation. Uh, this is where we live out the Christ life. This is where we uh, adjust our lives, our behavior, because of the recognition of who we actually are. This discovery of knowing God. And once we understand uh, this sense of identity of who we are in Christ, it changes the way we live. And Paul would write about that saying, we're called to that. But there's a next dimension that Paul also addresses, uh, and this really means living beyond yourself. This means that you live a life to serve. 
Service is at the heart of the Christian walk. In Philippians 2, verse 4 to 8, uh, Paul writes and he says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Listen to what he says. Each of you. That puts a demand on every Christ follower. Where Paul says, don't live as someone that just has your own interests at heart. Start asking God, how can your life be a blessing to others? Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He let that go. He made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. You see, the moment we talk about calling, it's very important because if you don't understand servanthood, you think that calling is actually something of a promotion to a title, to a position, to some role where it's all about you. I sometimes hear people speak about my calling. As if it's something that has repositioned them in a, a place where people should actually be serving them. But calling in essence flips that equation and says, whatever God has called you to, whatever God is blessing you with, whatever God is entrusting to you becomes the vehicle to serve others. This living beyond yourself implies three basic things. And uh, I'm going to use three words that all start with the letter S. So it's the triple S strategy. But the first thing, when you start understanding calling, you've got to understand it implies selflessness. We are called to live beyond ourselves and to give ourselves to Christ. And his kingdom. When we're talking about calling, we're talking about you asking the question, how can whatever God is entrusting to me be a blessing to others? Secondly, service. We are called to give ourselves to others and invest our lives in those around us. We are called to make love tangible. And thirdly, sacrifice. We are called to give up our rights so that we now can exhibit the glory of God. So don't misunderstand calling. Calling in the context of being a Christ follower is asking the question, how can I be a servant? Because that's what Jesus communicated. If you want to be great in the kingdom, become a servant. I like the introduction to a book that John Piper wrote. The book is titled, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. And, and the book is about, you know, general things in the kingdom. But really, this introduction was quite special. Um, I've taken that introduction and just reformatted it a little bit and adapted it, made it a little shorter. But I want to read this to you. He writes the following. He says, the mentality of the professional is not the mentality of the minister of life. Now, here's what's very important. When you are a servant, when you come with a serving spirit, you're not coming as a professional. We're not talking about excellence. We're talking about an attitude of professionalism that has come into the church that somehow has become the reference that defines calling. He says this is not the mentality of someone called to serve. Professionalism has nothing to do with the essence and the heart of the Christian ministry. 
The more professional we long to be, the more spiritual death we will leave in our wake. And then he makes these three big statements. He says, for there is no professional childlikeness. That's how we serve. There is no professional tender-heartedness because, you see, to serve, there is something that needs to stir in your heart. There is no professional panting after God because you're a professional, you have a title. He says, we have been crucified by, with Christ and yet now we live by faith in the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We are given to the gospel to recognize that this treasure that we carry, we carry in clay pots to show that the transcendent power is of God. That the life of Christ might be manifested through us. He says we are, we are, we are not professionals because we, we have to recognize there is an infinite difference between a leader whose heart is set on being a professional and the man and woman whose heart is set on being the aroma of Christ to others. A person called it's a man or woman of God whose heart is ever thirst for God, whose soul is ever following hard after God, whose eye is single to God, and in whom the power of God's spirit, the flesh, and the world have been crucified. Their ministry is like a generous flood of a life-giving river. And then he kind of encapsulates it by saying we are emphatically not part of a social team sharing goals with other professionals. The professionalization of the ministry is a constant threat to the profoundly spiritual nature of our work. Professionalism kills a man's belief that he is sent by God to invite people to become Christ-exalting spiritual ambassadors in this world. He prays a prayer. He says, banish all professionalism from our midst, O God, and in, it, in its place put white hot devotion, devotion to Jesus Christ, utter indifference to all material gain, unremitting labor to rescue the perishing, perfect the saints, and glorify our Lord. O God, let us rise, not as professionals, but as witnesses of the glory and the majesty of Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is a, a prayer that I pray for each one of us. Lord, help us that when we discover our calling, it would not be that that would take us to a place of professionalism. But a place of servanthood, laying our lives down of sacrifice of living a life of self-sacrifice. But calling is not just serving. Calling is also discovering your very unique role within the context of the body of Christ. It's a uh, very obvious that when we read scripture, and Paul reiterates that in various portions of scripture, that we are like a body and there are different parts of the body. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 4 to 6. He says, for as in one physical body, we have many parts, organs and members. And all of these parts do not have the same function or use. So we, numerous as we are, are one body in Christ, and individually we are parts of one another. Having these gifts, these faculties, these talents, these qualities that differ according to the grace that has been given to us, let us use it. So what Paul is saying is, discover your uniqueness. God wants to use the unique you. He made you. He put within you the passions, the desires, the skills, the talents, 
And it's within that unique molding of your life that God now says, I want to use you. And the discovery we need to make is that some of us will be used primarily within the context of the church, the program of the local church, where we will have a contribution to make so that we can see the flourishing of the saints, the growing of our people. That might mean that you have a passion for children and you have a gift for teaching. Well, that means that you can work in the children's ministry because your passion and your gifting flow together to serve in that particular space. But maybe you don't feel that it's within the context of the church. Well, then you might be a teacher at a school. And here's what you need to recognize. That calling is as important as your contribution would be within the context of the program of the church. You are called. You're called to that classroom. You are now the Adam of God and when you enter that classroom that becomes your garden and you guard and you tend it. That's the calling of God upon your life and you have to see yourself as being commissioned, as sent, as released to fulfill that calling. And whether it's the classroom or the boardroom, whether it's engaging in everyday life, maybe it's just the living room where you're engaging with your own children, there's a calling upon your life. And God wants to use you to make a difference so that you can truly be the faithful and the fruitful presence that God has intended for you to be. But we have to recognize that when we know that we're called, this is something that God wants to do in our lives using our gifts and our talents. But that is not enough. There is something about being empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit wants to function in our lives to come and empower us to so utilize what God has put in our lives at a level where we can truly see the impact for the kingdom of God. Now, Paul writes about this in Colossians 1, verse 24 to 29, when he writes about his own calling, his own sense of mission and engagement. Listen to what he says. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Paul says, listen, I'm prepared to suffer, to be afflicted, so that you can come to the full realization, to the full discovery of God's purpose for your life. Here's somebody that is an apostle, there's somebody that has revelation. There's somebody that could exalt himself. But he says, I want to serve. I want to lay my life down. Because I know this is my calling to you. He says, for the sake of his body, which is the church. Listen to these terms. I have become its servant. By the commission God gave to me. To present to you the word of God in all its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but now is disclosed to all the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now listen to this. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone in all wisdom that we may present everyone perfect in Christ to this end I labor struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me I want to encourage you to discover what Paul discovered 
He says, God commissioned me. God called me. God gave me a mandate. He says, now I lay my life down as a servant. And I, I do this because I recognize there is his empowerment within my life. You know, even Jesus recognized the power of the Holy Spirit in his own calling and ministry. It's recorded in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, where it says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. You see, the Holy Spirit comes to empower us so that we can effectively live out our calling within the framework of the fruit of the Spirit, which Galatians 5.22 says is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Also with the gifts of the Spirit, which Corinthians says is a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, workings of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of, of tongues. He says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing each one individually as he wills. What does that mean? It means that God wants to empower you with his fruit and with his gifts so that you can be an instrument of grace, so that you can bless others, so that you can fulfill your calling. God has given you everything you need. You just need to recognize you are called. When you discover that you are called, you now ask God to lead you. And if you read through the book of Acts, you see how Paul consistently references how they were led by the Spirit. Uh, Acts 13, 4, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Acts 18, 5, when Paul, Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit. Here's what I encourage you. Discover what it is to live within this reference of being empowered by the Holy Spirit so that you can fulfill your calling. I suppose one of the most amazing portions of scripture is where Jesus, at the beginning of his ministry, goes to the synagogue. And uh, it was the custom at that stage for someone to go and take one of the rolls on which the scriptures were etched and, and they would read it. Jesus goes and he looks for this portion of scripture in Isaiah. 61 and then he reads it and it says the following he found the place where it was written the spirit of the lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor he sent me to the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And when he had said that, he said, now the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. I want to say that if you can discover that you are called, would you create a moment where you recognize you are commissioned and that the spirit of the Lord is upon you? And that God wants to empower all the gifts, all the things that he has given you. Whether it be at your work, whether it be in your home, whether it be in the church. To fulfill your calling. Live out your calling. Become a partner. Be a called one. Become a true city changer. God bless you.